Hello, my name is Phil Sewell. I am the Strategic Security Architect for Voltage Data Privacy and Protection here at Microfocus. I'm joined by Neville De Silva, a Voltage Solution Architect. We're going to be discussing today how to enable secure data analytics for the Snowflake Data Cloud with Voltage Secure Data. I'm going to introduce you to the innovations within the Voltage Secure Data platform that makes this possible and explain the reference architecture for the combined Voltage and Snowflake solution. Neville will then demonstrate the capabilities live using Voltage Secure Data with the Snowflake Data Cloud. But first I'm going to explain why data privacy and protection is so important today. So what are we seeing today? Just uh, This is just a, a few slides to get us started and uh, set the, the tone, if you like, in terms of you know, why we are talking uh, with customers about uh, data privacy and protection, the trends in the industry, and some of those challenges. So, um, uh, so if we look at this, uh, clearly there is a massive move from more traditional analytic platforms uh, to cloud-based uh, platforms today, of course, with Snowflake being a major um, leader in that category today. So a massive marketplace, and we're seeing this happen with many of our large customers um, today that may have had previous investments in Hadoop and Teradata uh, and are moving to um, cloud-based analytic platforms. Um, in general, the, the marketplace around cybersecurity is, is changing a little to one more in terms of cyber resilience. And that is uh, really recognizing that it's not really a matter of if a data breach is going to happen. Uh, it truly is recognition today that um, we should all know that uh, a breach will happen at some point in time. So the question is more of when will this happen? And let's make sure we have the necessary uh, protection in place to really be resilient in the face of um, adversity. Um, with technologies like Voltage, we get to select which parts of the data set are most um, sensitive, uh, whether that comes under privacy regulations or mon monetization risk. Um, so we're talking here about protecting the crown jewels, whether they are account numbers, even credit card numbers, social security numbers, or email addresses, et cetera, that you're going to see in the demonstration today. Um, like everyone um, I'm talking to here in January 2021, we are still suffering from a global pandemic. That means we're working from home. That means we're working with a lot of data in the cloud and a lot more data being duplicated and replicated in many different platforms today. So the attack surface to sensitive data is, is, has never been higher in, in the um, IT world. Uh, the real world impacts of a of a breach today are significant. This varies drastically by the size of the breach and what type of industry you you are in and the type of data that could be breached. Uh, th this number of 3.86 million average comes from uh, the Ponymon Institute and just gives you a, a sense of the scale um, of monetary damage um, if if some of the sensitive data was ever lost. Um, with respect to the cloud, obviously a massive market today uh, shared between um, three large uh, providers um, and some other providers that are offering cloud services. But what we find talking to our largest enterprise customers is that it's not just um, the use of one cloud platform. It is a hybrid IT. It's a multi-cloud strategy. They, have, they want the flexibility to be able to um, use services of multiple cloud vendors. Um, and also share uh, capabilities for on-premise as well as in the cloud. And of course, what's driving uh, a lot of this data protection is the expanding presence of the um, data privacy regulations in the world today, covering many geographies around the world um, and real fines becoming significant um, uh, to, to businesses around the world today. So, so um, if we look at this a little bit more simply in terms of what we're talking about today, right, is we have customers that are trying to adopt the latest uh, platforms, capabilities in IT. Uh, specifically, what we're seeing is it's actually a combination of both an increase in um, um, data analytics, getting more value from the data that they collect today, whether that is employee data or consumer data, and in combination with adoption of the cloud. 
Uh, and these things together um, um, are occurring in this example today we're talking about with, with Snowflake, um, for, for instance. So we have customers that are driving more business transformation, but they're doing this in a collision course with the increased pressures of regulatory compliance, the privacy requirements around that data, and the now, you know, if you put more data in one place and you put it on the cloud, of course, the risks of a data breach dramatically increase. So, so, so these are, you know, conflicting um, uh, things in the industry today that saying, hey, yes, we want to do this, but we have this concern and we're doing it um, among quite, te uh, quite technical challenges today. Uh, we truly need enterprise class products, products that can function properly at scale in the cloud and provide a huge amount of um, uh, flexibility in how they actually integrate um, into the technologies. So what is voltage secure data? I'm not going to go through this in all detail. We, of course, have um, lots of information we can share uh, as a follow up in terms of um, all of the details, uh, but at a very high level, what we're doing here is providing a platform for data protection that offers field level uh, format preserving protection capabilities. Okay, and it takes various forms. Uh, one being format preserving encryption. Uh, Voltage is a, is a leader in that technology in the world today. Um, there is hashing, a one-way one -way protection mechanisms, and there is a, a, a true tokenization um, capability for the PCI industry. But this form of encryption, I should note here quickly, is not the type of encryption that most people are familiar with. This is a mode of encryption, standard-based encryption, still based on AES, still using 256-bit keys, but has some very... Uh, valuable characteristics in its format preserving uh, capabilities. So we have a, a wide variety of integration capabilities, whether they're client side APIs or REST services. We can write functions in the database, the process files, and even do things in more transparent uh, fashion with our secure data sentry product. All of this is backed by a key management system that is a stateless key management system. Again, making um, the infrastructural management um, uh, requirements uh, much uh, lower than traditional forms of encryption. And of course, we're supporting not just cloud, not just analytics, but many different types of platforms and use cases. So it's all about the data, right? And we have to start understanding how we, how we protect the data, what it looks like, how users interact with it. So here's uh, is a very simple example here. We've got a person's first name, last name, the social security number, date of birth, and a credit card number. So we've used our capabilities in Voltage Secure Data to protect this. And you see that the length of the data, the data types are preserved, but these are random permutations of the original data. In this case, we are using um, uh, format preserving encryption, um, and perhaps we're using the, um, uh, the tokenization technology for the credit card number. But a few things to, to look at carefully as we look at these, these values. Of course, they are um, all the same length, all the same type. But in some cases, they are partially protected, like the credit card number and the social, where the last four digits are in the clear and the credit card number has leading six digits in the clear, just like you would see on, on a printed credit card receipt uh, from a retail um, situation. Um, the date that we've uh, protected here is a real date. Um, it is, of course, a random permutation of the original date, but it is a valid date. Um, and you may not be able to do the math in your head, but uh, with credit card numbers, we can do something special. In this case, the number on the left is potentially a real credit card number because it observes the LUN digit checking or the checksum of modulus 10 uh, mathematics. Uh, the number on the right we have chosen to reverse that checksum. So, we, so um, it, it's just one way of actually proving that that credit card number in the green box on the right-hand side is not actually a real credit card number. It cannot be because it doesn't observe the uh, LUN uh, digit checking. So this is in isolation one person, but let's look at a second person. Um, and there's some things here that are useful to, to look at. One is that the person shares the same last name. They share the same date of birth. Their social security numbers only differ 
are different by one digit in the last four digits. And as we've seen above, we're only protecting um, the, the first five digits of the social, leaving the last four in the clear. So what does this do when we encrypt this data or tokenize this data? Well, we of course get um, now um, uh, the same length data, the same data type. The last name is protected exactly the same way. This is what we call a deterministic type of algorithm. So we can um, uh, know for certain that under the right conditions, right, this, the use of the same system, the same encryption key, we'll always get the same value for the same input value, right? The same output value from the same input value. Um, second to note here is that although the social security numbers originally only differ by a single digit in the last four, at the, the encrypted social security number is completely different. So it does address a question we get sometimes in terms of um, how this um, algorithm works uh, in its format preserving nature. So th this is just to, to demonstrate uh, that we are using the full nine digits to actually create uh, that new social security number. The date of birth is um, exactly the same as Leslie Roberts' encrypted date of birth in the above example. So again, showing deterministic protection of the data. So if we apply this to a number of records in a database, we can mix and match format preserving encryption with secure stateless tokenization. We can do things at a partial um, level, protecting um, middle digits of a credit card, for instance, or leading digits of a social. Uh, so we have those capabilities. And if we look just a little bit further, right, there's, there's always this question about, well, in the analytics world, right, when we have this, this data protected across hundreds or thousands of tables that may have relationships, what does that look like? So let's just delve into this just really quickly here. This is, this is an example of some healthcare data. Um, but you can see that this data is, is protected. The national IDs, I've, I've changed the, the terminology here from social security number to national IDs, have been protected. And you can see that uh, names have been protected, et cetera. But, but if we look at this as an example of things related to a primary key of a national ID, these, these foreign keys and these joins are still valid, meaning the, the referential integrity of the data is still exactly the same as it was in the original data set. Okay? So this really is, is what we mean when we talk about performing analytics, joins, um, uh, reporting, consolidated reports on data that actually has its most vital parts protected by format preserving capabilities at the field level. This is a high level reference um, architecture diagram showing um, uh, the, the entire story um, moving left to right in terms of how the data is protected, um, how um, it moves into the Snowflake data cloud, and then how it's accessed, whether it's accessed in its protected form or whether we're access, uh, accessing decrypting or detokenizing the real data. Uh, so we're going to break this down, but the general principle here is uh, depend, depending on the specifics of the security requirements here, we may want to uh, protect this data on-premise before we move it to the cloud. So uh, that can happen in many different ways uh, through traditional ETL tools. Uh, this data could actually be protected already um, using uh, voltage secure data um, at its uh, closer to its uh, source um, origins. Um, our own structured data manager can help with the discovery and classification of sensitive data and then trigger the protection, the encryption uh, tokenization of the data with secure data. But uh, many of these options would be preferred to, uh, to be used to protect data uh, before moving that data to, um, to the cloud. In the middle, of course, this is where the data now is protected at rest in use and as it potentially moves around within uh, uh, the cloud um, components. And then the right hand side, uh, again, is talking about various ways that um, users interact with this data. Um, that's, we'll explain the, the, uh, the use of the cloud API in just a second. Okay. So uh, again, um, left hand side, 
the ingestion of this data. We are looking at protecting the data uh, at the field level uh, using really the, a combination of field level format preserving technologies. Um, we have a variety of APIs and tools that can do this and, and integrate with tools like uh, Informatica, for instance. Um, all of this, of course, is, is using the Voltage Secure Data Stateless Key Management System. Um, and the, 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 the true benefit here is if we are talking with customers that already protect data with Voltage Secure Data, that, that data can simply move in uh, to uh, the Snowflake Data Cloud in, um, you know, without any further work going on. Now, when, once the data is in the Snowflake Data Cloud, uh, we don't need actually any Voltage software uh, to, to continue to, to provide protection. That job has already been done prior uh, to moving the data to uh, Snowflake. So uh, for uh, a large amount of users that will be doing analytics using protected data, and, and uh, we'll explain how that is done um, in the demonstration, um, uh, there is no actual uh, use of the, the Voltage software. So the, the benefits of format preservation, keeping the, the data in the same length, the, the benefits of being able to do partial uh, protection of data um, can extend the life of this data for analytic purposes without decrypting or detokenizing the data. And of course, the, the transformation of this data uh, still guarantees the data's uniqueness and the referential integrity um, of, of the data as well. Now, when we do need to um, decrypt or detokenize this data for people that are allowed to see it for true business reasons, um, there is a, a number of things we can do. Uh, so today, uh, what we are um, demonstrating and, and talking to customers about is basically leveraging the native capabilities of the Snowflake Data Cloud, um, specifically um, how users are, are given permission into certain roles, um, the masking policies for certain uh, columns and tables and the capability to invoke an external function from Snowflake. So um, when a user has a role and that role um, is allowed to invoke a function on a specific column, that function um, actually um, makes a call to a cloud API gateway. Uh, AWS call this the, the AWS API gateway. Uh, Microsoft Azure core API management. So uh, we have done uh, testing uh, on both of these um, um, cloud API uh, capabilities. And that in turn invokes a, um, a voltage secure data cloud function in the AWS world, that is a Lambda function in, in Microsoft Azure, that is an Azure function. So those functions are going to be uh, uh, working um, next to that cloud API environment. And all it needs from the Voltage Secure Data Key Servers at the bottom of this diagram is the actual encryption key. And it's going to ask for it, uh, and that key will be derived. And it's going to be exactly the same key, the symmetric key that was used to encrypt the data um, at the start of this process on the left-hand side. So really, the, the access to the data is done uh, without the user knowing the, the functions that are being used uh, to decrypt or detokenize this data more transparently. And all this is done really by their um, part, or their, their um, having a role um, um, that allows them to see certain data uh, rather than other data. The use of the cloud provider's API, whether that be AWS API Gateway or Azure API Management, as, as we're showing here in the diagram, is just one way that this um, uh, combination of technologies could work today. So we are investigating the development of a user-defined function for the Snowflake Data Cloud. In that situation, that function would be installed uh, in the Snowflake um, environment, and um, uh, there's, two, there's two possibilities to how that function would work. It would work using our simple API, where the simple API would request a key 
from the Voltage Secure Data Key Servers um, directly uh, and uh, obviously cache that key for optimal performance and perform decryption operations within the Snowflake Data Cloud uh, itself. Um, the REST API would be uh, an alternate um, approach to that scenario. In either case, um, that, is, that um, would then uh, bypass uh, the use of a cloud API. So it is something that uh, our organizations are investigating today. So in the example Neville's going to show, we have a number of users. Uh, Neville will be a user with an HR role. Uh, we have Rich as a demo user for finance, a customer service rep is Monica, and we have the sysadmin role as well. So you can see here, these, these are not all the, uh, the columns, uh, but this is uh, a good uh, number of them. And you can see that the check marks are indicating that uh, these specific columns of these tables um, should be visible to those people with those specific roles. So, um, as you can see, that most of the users, except the sysadmin, should be able to see uh, the person's name, meaning the, the, the function to actually decrypt the name um, is part of their role. Uh, city and state, as well as the credit score on the bottom, are all actually clear text values. There's no real need to encrypt, uh, tokenize these values, as they're not of any significant value on their own. So they are actually left in the clear. Email address, date of birth, we can see how, how those um, are protected and accessible to certain roles. Date of birth is something a little bit more sensitive and only the HR role has access to that. Um, the credit card number, for instance, uh, is only available for someone in the finance role um, and not uh, HR or service uh, customer service reps. The, the other thing to keep in mind here is that we actually have two tables. Uh, we have the, the main table that's holding the person data, and we have a credit score. And, the, and how those tables relate is by a join on the social security number. So um, we're going to show basically how data can be um, analyzed across two tables in a join without the requirement to actually decrypt that uh, primary key and foreign key column. So in the demonstration that Neville will take you through, uh, we'll have a, a look at a sysadmin account to see what the data looks like in the base table. Um, we can see that certain columns uh, are, are clearly uh, protected. Actually, it's, it's using a, a mode called obviously protected mode, like, a, like how we're protecting the social security number. Um, but the, the sysadmin, although they've, uh, they do have you know, they, they've been used to create a lot of the underlying roles and functions um, and masking policies. They actually don't have access to see the, the, the real data in themselves. So then we'll step through a number of users, the finance user, and, and how they um, uh, are not um, uh, able to see the social security number. Uh, but when they do a join, uh, between the two tables, they can see um, decrypted names and you know, the credit scores, but they we can they can actually do that without decrypting uh, the social security number. Uh, now the HR user uh, can see things like the social security number. They have access to uh, their role gives them access to decrypt the social security number, but not the credit card number. And when they run the same join. Uh, we'll get exactly the same results, but they actually will see decrypted social security numbers. Um, so if we look a little bit further, we go on to step three here. The HR user queries the main table, um, and, and really all this is driven by the roles that these people have. So because they don't have a finance role, they cannot see the um, tokenized credit uh, card. Uh, and actually to keep things um, uh, to, to simplify things for the end user, instead of showing a tokenized credit card number, we're actually showing a null value. So that is, uh, Neville will show you how that is done in the definition of the function. Um, the dates of birth, uh, again, um, are, are extra sensitive in, in some businesses. So the finance user tries to see the date of birth, and of course the, they are uh, not able to see that. And, and again, we are not um, complicating things here by showing an encrypted date of birth that could be, could, that will look like a real date. Instead, 
we are simply uh, returning a null value so they can clearly see they cannot see dates of birth uh, whereas the HR user uh, can actually see the decrypted dates of birth. The customer service rep in step four um, has a mix here, right? So, so this person does need social security numbers, but not dates of birth. So it shows the granularity here of how these uh, roles um, are used in combination with the users and the uh, masking policies. Then we'll go back to the sysadmin uh, user and um, and see how uh, the roles, functions, and masking policies um, have been defined. Over to you, Neville. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Let's look at the some of the real life data here. And like you described, what we have here are two tables, which we call as voltage table, which has a sample data as shown. So let's quickly look at it. As you can see, we have name, addresses, email, credit card, date, and social security number. These values are, are stored in the database in a protected format. We also have a table for joins, which is called credit underscore score. And let's look at the sample data from that table. We have a social security number and we have the score. For this demonstration, we are going to rely on the four users like Phil mentioned, and they are going to be assigned to four roles. There is gonna be a, a sysadmin role, which will be used for doing the sysadmin activity. Then we have a human resources role, a finance role and a customer service role. For each of these roles, we create a three for the users. We have Neville, Rich and Monica. So let's go to the step one of the demonstration where we look at the different behavior based on users membership in a certain role. So we are looking at a finance user logged in as a finance role. So we have Rich in the finance. If Rich tries to access the social security number, Let's see what he sees. As you can see, Rich is able to select social security number, but this is the obviously protected social security number. This is not a clear text social security number. And uh, this is because Rich does not have access to the social security number, but will he be able to run a join where the join happens on social security numbers between two encrypted tables where SSN is protected in both of those tables. So let's run this query. We're trying to get the name, social security number, and the credit score of the person from the table. For that, we will have to join the person table or the voltage table and the credit score table. So we have the name, which is decrypted. We have the encrypted social security number. Remember the finance users do not have it. And then we have the credit score. How would this be different if somebody is in the HR role? So we have an example of a user Neville who is in the HR role. And let's go ahead and run the similar query as what we did with the finance user. So if you look at the SSN, now you would be able to see the entire nine digit SSN number instead of the protected alphanumeric as you saw here. So this shows that the HR user has full access to the social security number and the decryption of it. How would the join be different for this user versus somebody in the finance role? So the same query, the only difference is we also saw Fabian in this being written, but instead of the protected social security number, which you saw in the case of HR, in the finance, in the HR case, you're going to see the decrypted social security number. Notice the users logging on are differentiated based only on their role membership. We have not done any difference in the query which was run. Now, what happens when an HR role tries to look at the credit card information, which HR role doesn't have access to. They can still run the queries, but instead of seeing the credit card information, they are going to see a null, which shows them they do not have access to the data. Now, if somebody in the finance domain, for example, Rich, runs the same query, he should be able to see the credit card data because his user is allowed access to that data. If Rich tries to go to some data like 
date of birth, which is really reserved only for the HR. Then let's see what he gets. He's able to select name city, but not the date. Because he do not have access to that, so we should be able to go back to the HR and still be able to see the date in the clear as you can see it here. We also have the third user, which is a customer service rep where they would need to see uh, things like social security number. So let's run this. For the employees or for the customers and they can see the entire social security number as you can see here. This user does not need to see the date of birth. So if we try to run this select as Monica, I am not able to see the date of birth for the employees or customers. Now the user which created all of this or the ETL user is in this case uh, sysadmin user and sysadmin user initially created this roles as well as assigned the users to these roles. Let's see what sysadmin can see. So if I go to the select star from table and run, I should be able to return data where I have access, but I do not have access even though I created the other roles as sysadmin. I do not have access to see the names, the emails or SSN and other data. Let's look at how these roles were created. We created a uh, individual roles uh, for the three categories like HR, finance and customer rep. Then we assigned users to that role and then we provided grants to those roles so that they will be able to do database operations. The real magic which happens behind the scenes is the power of the functions which actually helps us to decrypt the data. Like Phil suggested earlier, data by default is always in its protected state as is the state you can see here. The name is really incomprehensible to our naked eye. I mean, it looks something like a gobbledygook, but this is Fabian's data we are looking at here. And the email address is protected as well. So the functions, you have a number of things. What, I, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to unprotect the name. What do I need to unprotect the name? Like Phil mentioned, it is going to refer to in what is termed and voltage terms as an identity which is used for protection of the name and a format. So we have a format defined here as well as identity and to make this function more efficient we can even batch some rows or a number of rows to perform efficient operations. So as you can see I have specified the max batch size here as a million. And then you could do the functions, similar functions for prote unprotection of email, dates, and so on. As a final step, what you will do is you will create the masking policies using these functions. And these masking policies correspond to the slide which you saw earlier. We are going to apply masking policies for the name, email, date, credit card number, and the SSN number. So let me go and show you the masking policies. So here we start creating the masking policy. This is the masking policy for the name. As you can see, if the role belongs to HR, finance and customer rep. So in our case, all the three users which we looked at, they have ability to decrypt the name. You could very well change it as your needs change. Similarly, email is allowed for everybody for decryption. Once you go to the birth date, only the HR users are allowed to decrypt the birth date. And we have an option here. Either you could return a value as we are doing the case here, where you would be able to see an encrypted email instead of a null, or you could say, I want to show you a null, not an encrypted email. The change is a really small change in what comes out of the function if this primary case is not true. So we created the masking policies for credit card numbers, social security numbers. So that really concludes the demonstration on my Snowflake. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you.